Come on, Bobby, hit somebody. Hurry up. Come on, let's go. Get on the Hi, I'm Tom Brookshire. And I'm Pat Summerall. Last week, there was an abundance of excitement in the NFL as no fewer than 10 of the 13 games went right down to the wire. Pat, we had our share of upsets or ties that could be considered as such, too. I know one team that would have gladly settled for a tie. You're referring to the Buffalo Bills, who lost their eighth straight game and are making a serious run of becoming the first team ever to lose all 14. Now, though, on to something of a happier nature, like the first half of our show in which we'll see joy in Yankee <laughs> Stadium, a tightening of the race in the AFC Central and a big 49er victory in Minnesota that comes on like a remembrance of things past. We'll also look into those victories by Atlanta and New England as well as the slaughter of Buffalo, which I thought was outlawed some years ago. We'll be back to show you all of the best of last week's pro football action right after this message. The San Diego Chargers scored 49 points against the New York Jets, which was the highest total since the opening week of the season. Last week, the Giants got a measure of revenge for the city of New York as they showed the Chargers a little East Coast-style scoring power. Last Sunday, after a long absence, the Giants' offense rejoined the team. Its return was announced when Fran Tarkenton hit Coleman Zeno, number 88, for an apparent touchdown in the first quarter. Although the play was nullified by a penalty, it was but a momentary lapse, which a now burstingly healthy Ron Johnson, number 30, soon rectified. Johnson's return to form has loaded both barrels for New York, and last week, San Diego was staring right down the bore. Helping Johnson was number 31, Charlie Evans, whose first of three touchdowns left the Chargers sprawling victims of a shockwave. And by the time frantic Fran the scrambling man was finished, he and Dick Kotite had given New York a 21-0 lead. Two weeks ago, John Hadle threw for four touchdowns. Last week, the Giants stole that many from him. Even Hadle to the ghost, Gary Garrison, was less than supernatural. And it was the ghost who was looking for a place to hide. But no one keeps a great receiver like Garrison under the sheet for long. Rookie Mike Montgomery's pass to the ghost brought the Chargers to within four points. But then they were deluged. Tarkenton, Evans, Johnson, and Zeno poured it on as twice in the last quarter, big plays led to short scoring runs. And all of a sudden, the Giants' offense looks mighty healthy again. What a shame for them that it's so late in the season. But last week anyway, the Giants provided at least half the joy in the Big Apple by whipping the Chargers 35-17. It's amazing what a difference one healthy player like Ron Johnson can make. Yes, and last week we predicted that the Cleveland Browns would soon be healthy again and on their way to a rapid recovery. Looks as though we might have been wrong. Sunday afternoons in Pittsburgh's Three Rivers Stadium are becoming colorful indeed. Although Terry Bradshaw is but the latest in a series of Steeler quarterback hopefuls, the message remains the same. In one of the NFL's oldest rivalries, the Browns met the Steelers in Pittsburgh. Cleveland quarterback Bill Nelson used to be a Steeler hopeful. 
And after being traded, he led the Browns to several divisional titles. But he's now hearing the beat of a different drummer, or at least the drumming of different feet. Although expecting to see only limited action this year, Nelson has been forced to play regularly due to the slow development of Mike Phipps. The Browns have seen their offense sputter, choke, and cough up the ball. John Rouser, number 48, intercepted two of Nelson's ruptured ducks. Bradshaw, on the other hand, was having much better success, handing off to Frenchy Fuqua as the Steelers spin it out to a 10-0 first quarter lead on Bradshaw's touchdown plunge. After Roy Jarella kicked his second of four field goals, Bradshaw began throwing to his backs instead of handing off, and the Steelers looked brighter than ever. And then an ominous event occurred. After gaining 39 yards on a scramble, Bradshaw was forced from the game with an injury to his right foot. The long-range effect of the injury is not known at this time, but the focus of Steeler fortunes will certainly shift to Terry Hanratty, at least for a while. Coming in cold, Hanready did manage to keep the team afloat with passes like this one to Donnie Shanklin, number 25. But without Bradshaw, the Browns sought to make their move on the Steelers. A fumble snap resulted in a safety that made the score 16 to two. Then Nelson threw a pass that eventually came down in the arms of Fairhooker, number 43. At the opening of the fourth quarter, Bo Scott scored from the one, and suddenly it was 16 to nine. But the Steelers had played too well to lose again to Cleveland. And with Terry Bradshaw back on the sidelines for the fourth quarter, Hanratty and Dave Smith combined for an electrifying touchdown that settled the issue. The Steelers are now tied for first place with Cleveland, and you don't need a weatherman to know which way the wind is blowing in Pittsburgh. The barometer is sky high. Steelers 26, Browns 9. The 49ers went to Minnesota on a cold Sunday, and nobody gave them much of a chance. But on the surprising strength of their defense, they won by three. Last Sunday was another cold one, and the 49ers were again the underdogs. This time, they won by four. Under an ice blue umbrella of Minnesota autumn, there occurred the classic situation. A gutty offense faced with fourth and one at the six yard line against one of the best defenses in football. In this case, however, the defense belongs to the 49ers and it's the Vikings who fell short. But the Vikings who do play eye popping defense got the ball back on the very next play. Indeed, they were given five turnovers by the 49ers, but couldn't score a touchdown. In this crucial third quarter series of events, the Vikings snapped the ball eight times within the 10 yard line, yet could only realize three points. This could have won the game for San Francisco. While the Purple Gang was very much in evidence during the game, they were ultimately outplayed by the 49er defense, which allowed the Vikings two first downs the entire first half. (laughs) 
As they had done in their upset victory last year in Minnesota, the 49ers were able to control the ball. Vic Washington broke out for 42 yards, the longest run of the season against the Vikings. Bruce Taylor was dazzling on punt returns as the special teams continued their superlative play. All of these sunshine efforts, however, produced but one shadowy touchdown. A pass from John Brody to Gene Washington, number 18. Even though the Vikings caught fire late in the game on the receiving of number 27, Bob Grimm, the 49ers saved their only interception of the game for a very opportune moment. From the 49er 15-yard line, Norm Sneed found Rosie Taylor on the three. And the 49ers had done it again. This was number four in a row for the San Franciscans. And that definitely deserves some first place patty cake. 49ers 13, Minnesota 9. Beating the Vikings in Bloomington two years in a row is some kind of a job, and those 49ers are looking awfully tough to catch in the NFC West. Huh? And as Los Angeles sinks slowly in the West, Pat, a rough bunch from Georgia is quietly creeping up on the leaders. Last week, they sneaked into Cincinnati and just about finished off the Bengal Tiger for this year. The poor Bengal Tiger. After six consecutive defeats, things were bad enough. But last Sunday brought a new way for Cincinnati to lose. Norm Van Brocklin's Falcons were in town, and with the Dutchman himself calling the plays, and with Dick Shiner again shining at quarterback, the Falcons marched down the field on their first possession. 47 yards were consumed on this catch and run by Harmon Wages. Shiner passed to tight end Jim Mitchell, and the Falcons had what appeared to be an easy 7-0 lead. But a motion penalty nullified the score, and Atlanta's offense then folded up until the game was almost over. Meanwhile, quarterback returnee Virgil Carter could not spark the Bengal offense back to life. Carter's most effective play was to hold the ball for Horst Muhlmann, who booted two field goals, one from 51 yards, and again, he accounted for all the Cincinnati scoring. The Cincinnati defense protected a 6-3 lead with a fourth-quarter goal line stand. But unlike last year, Virgil Carter and week number eight were not magic for the Bengals. With only 66 seconds to play, Dick Shiner passed over the middle to pull back Art Malone. The great effort by Art Malone, the former wrestling champion from Arizona State, had sent the Bengals to their seventh straight loss, while giving the Falcons their third straight win and a tie for second with the Rams in the NFC West. We'll have more exciting action on This Week in Pro Football right after this brief message. Saturday. Rookie quarterbacks come from the state of California. New England's Jimmy Plunkett is from Stanford, where he did everything but sell programs, and where he won the Heisman Trophy. Houston's Dan Pastorini came from Santa Clara University, and although he didn't receive as much publicity as Plunkett, Pastorini should become a great quarterback. Let's take a look at these two rookies as they went head-to-head -head last week. In Foxborough, Massachusetts, two of pro football's finest rookie quarterbacks got together as New England's Jim Plunkett, number 16, dueled Houston's Dan Pastorini. Plunkett's running and passing led the Patriots to their first score, a 10-yard pass to Hubie Bryant, number 45, who did a good Elmo Wright imitation. Houston's rookie quarterback, number 7, Dan Pastorini, has been plagued by interceptions this year, and the Patriots robbed him blind as New York Jet cast off Randy Beverly, number 27, picked off this pass. The 
interception gave the Patriots a chance to unveil their new passing combination. Number 24, Bob Gladio, to number 45, Hubie Bryant. The 48-yard pass play set up a two-yard run by number 40, Jack Maitland, a Baltimore Colts reject. The score gave New England a 14-6 halftime lead. In the second half, Dan Pastorini flashed the form that caused many scouts to rate him the equal of Plunkett as he connected with number 18, Charlie Joyner. This touchdown and a one-yard plunge by Pastorini gave Houston a 20-14 edge. But then interceptions again haunted the Euler rookie. A Pastorini pass was batted in the air and picked off by Patriot linebacker Steve Kiner, number 57. The interception set up the bull-like charges of fullback Jim Nance, number 35, one of the few veterans who has survived the house cleaning by the new Patriot management. Nance's four-yard smash put New England back on top, 21-20. Pastorini, who completed 18 of 36 passes for the day, went back to the air, and again an interception ruined the Houston drive. Linebacker Jim Chionsky, number 50, picked off the air and pass, and set up the final New England touchdown. A two-yard run by Carl Garrett, number 30. In the battle of the rookies, Jim Plunkett bested Dan Pastorini as the rebuilt Patriots dropped Houston 28-20. Well, Pat, it looks like the New England Patriots are a vastly improved team this year. Really does, Tom, and there's a team down in Miami, too, that's really improved over previous years. The Dolphins are in first place in the AFC East, having lost just one game. Last week, the last place Buffalo Bills traveled to Miami in search of their first victory, but instead ended up with their eighth loss of the season. For the Buffalo Bills, it's been a long, long year. The Bills were 0-7 on the season and came to Miami in search of sunshine and victory number one. For the Miami Dolphins, 1971 has been a very good year. The Dolphins are in first place in the AFC East and seem to get stronger with each game. Against Miami, Buffalo came out shooting. In the game's second play, number 30, Wayne Patrick bolted for 41 big yards. On the game's third play, Buffalo fumbled, and Miami's Jim Riley, number 70, pounced on the ball. With number 12, Bob Greasy at the controls, Miami marched downfield to a score and Greasy's 21-yard scramble was the key play of the drive. The drive ended when powerful Larry Zonka, number 39, burst over for a score. Zonka and Jim Kick have been an awesome tandem this year, but Kick was injured and in his place was number 22, Mercury Morris. All Mercury did was sprint for 115 yards on the afternoon, and he may just be the finest fill-in running back around. On this play, watch number 66, guard Larry Little as he pulls out and leads the blocking for Morris. Morris's running set up the second Miami score, a touchdown pass from Bob Greasy to number 42, Paul Warfield. Warfield is the big play element in the Dolphins' attack. He can run the end around as well as catch. And his 39-yard run set up another Miami score. Second-year tight end Jim Mandich, number 88, is finally starting to pay dividends as he hauled in a touchdown pass from Greasy that made it 21 to nothing. A 
Although the Miami offense has received most of the ink, the Dolphin defense is getting tough, too. This interception by number 13, Jake Scott, choked off a Buffalo bid and preserved the shutout. Against the fumble-ridden Bills, Miami's powerful attack was in high gear. Gero Yuprimian added two field goals, and the versatile Dolphin offense rolled over Buffalo 34 to nothing. This week, the first-place Dolphins will need every available weapon as they face the improving Pittsburgh Steelers. In the second half of our show, we'll be bringing you the surprise elements. And last week, the biggest shockers came in the guise of tied ball games. Of course, I'm referring to the Saints Raiders tie and the Redskins Eagles tie. In the vernacular, that's called sister kissing. And we'll also take a look, Pat, at the NFC Central, where Detroit continues to walk the Razor's edge and where the Packers and Bears met for the 105th time. We'll also see the Dallas win and perhaps the biggest upset of the week, the Jets over the Chiefs. And in our feature, we'll take a look at a man who coaches an aspect of the game that few people are really aware of. We'll see that feature, and we'll have more exciting action on this week in pro football right after this brief message. At the second half ball club, then you've probably wondered why some teams so outclass their opponents in the later stages of the game. The answer is strength and stamina, two qualities that are not necessarily inherent in the individual, and that's why some teams employ what is known as a strength coach. And for those of you who would like to know what a strength coach does, allow me to introduce you to Malin. <laughs> A man must ready his body for survival in the NFL. The preparation of sinew disciplines the soul as well. It is a ritual of pain, a physical commitment of sacrifice taken by players and coaches alike. In this age of specialization, weight training is controlled by a unique breed of football man, the strength coach. The San Diego Chargers muscle man is named Malin. That's all, just Malin. Like everyone, I started off with two names. Uh, Malin Wilsey is my real name. In fact, my junior year in high school, I had girls' gym for the first three weeks. So having many different problems with the name, and uh, either Mr. Malin or Mr. Wilsey or Wilsey Malin or Malin Wilsey, and finally I just dropped and just used Malin. My hair started checking out in 1948. It was real popular then, what they called a Hollywood butch. It was short on top and kind of wild on the sides with a little crease down the back. And I had my senior picture taking like that, and I got the proofs. I could see I was just gonna have a little bit of hair along the sides, and there's different ways of solving it, but then I felt that uh, I think I'd just be Malin and shave it, that's all. Malin is a Charger coach who seems lost in the world of pro football. He was too small for the game even in high school, and today he knows nothing of strategy or technique. Yet he understands the needs of an athlete. He speaks the language, and after 20 years of bodybuilding experience, he can bring out the best any man has to offer. Malin's work begins as the season ends. At his La Jolla Health Studio, he carries out his personalized back, methods of it. preparation. Back a little more. Come on, come on, put out now, all the way, that's it. Okay, one more, come on, that's it. Easy, Tommy, come on, not too fast, back over the ice. Boom, take a big quick pop. Lifting weights has been done in all sports, but it's never been broken down by the sport and by the position. This is something that I feel I have done. I'm gonna work those clubs now, that's the idea of this one now. And when you grab that jersey that way, you can rip their head clear off with this one. Real easy, just if you get a hand on a man, you can pull him down, Bobby, that's it. I think when you're breaking through and you grab that guy and pull him down, that's the secret right there. Okay. <sighs> right like that, you're pulling every quarter back down, one arm right in there. Pull, grab that shoulder pads and pull him around, pull. In this particular exercise, he's gonna push real heavy. I try to psych him up a little ahead of time, just like a football game. And I, I feel that this is something that I can do and get the most out of a ball player by really putting pressure on him, having to think about this lift. Lean back a little bit, lean back and really put out from there. I really work on it now. Sunday, 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 all the way. Oh, Jimmy Hill, I love you, all the way. That's it, real tight, real tight. Grip it tight, elbows in tight, make it good, make it count. Think of fourth quarter, be tough then, be tough all the way. Okay, now put out, come on, think, think. Think of that big hit you got in L.A. Come on. There's many different gimmicks and gadgets out to get in shape, lose weight, trim off, put on. And really, it uh, boils right down to work. I've always gone by the theory that if a machine does the work, the machine gets the benefit. It takes work to get results, and I, I realize that, so I push it. Boom. Okay. Boom. On the snap of the ball. Think. Here we go. Hip. 
coach, Malin must wait till game day to test the effectiveness of his method. The months of preparation have now reached the proving ground. Draw, draw, draw! I'm very deeply involved, I feel. There's so much physical involved in football, and everyone can improve, get stronger, get faster, get quicker, and actually the ones that really put out and do this and it shows this and their game performance, I'm real excited about. I think your speed's back. I think your speed's yeah, back. It's there, you know. Hope he starts really using you on the outside, you know? No, you're yeah. in there. You're there now. You're, you're there now, really Lynn. Good. Joe, how's those arms going, huh? Huh? You know, all those plenty you can work with one arm yet, can't you? Yeah. Huh? You'd be the strongest man in the world on one arm unless that arm gets well. How do you feel? Huh? You tired? Are you tired? Yeah. Let me see your heart. Yeah, you're tired. Hey, we surprised those guys last work on that bench press, huh? You, two workouts ago, we, you know, you weren't you pleased, really, Gary? Yeah. You know, a little bit we've done, you know? Gene, come on, you two, don't be like that. Don't, come on now. Not you. Where'd you go? Uh, I tried to find you. I'll just get that little cup and sit down. I want you to be ready. Are you ready? Yeah. Marty, how's that arm? Ball to the four-yard line. Yo, B! Are you kidding? It's a rocket line. <laughs> <laughs> it is. You're going to hurt people you're throwing so hard. That was a hell of a block in that one down here you got. Don't you think? Huh? You're getting close now. Get back. Yeah, I'm beginning to get there. But actually, when I look out there and look at a fellow like Babbage or Terry Owens or Gene Foster, uh, and they do something extremely well, I jump up and down and hope down deep that they know, that I know, that I've helped them in a small way. Okay, okay! <laughs> I'm kind of a rebel in my field. I think weightlifting is still a rebel in its field in sports. And the time will come when everyone will have a strength coach. Then when I can prove that I can make a good athlete better, I'm really excited about it. Woo! Malin would have appreciated Detroit and Denver, who are two of the most physical teams in pro football. And last week, they got together to see who was the stronger. In Mile High Stadium, the maturing Denver Broncos met the very grown-up Detroit Lions. But for a while, it was the Lions who were short on poise. This Bill Thompson interception of a Greg Landry pass was only one of a number of mistakes that throttled the Lions in the early going. A determined Denver defense and an Alti Taylor fumble combined to shut out the Lions in the first half. Meanwhile, the Broncos were moving well behind their good backs, number 44, Floyd Little, and number 11, Bobby Anderson. Anderson set up the Broncos' first score with a 36-yard burst, and then he finished what he started by taking a flare from Don Horn for 12 yards and a 10-0 lead over the Detroit Lions. might have put the game out of reach if this bomb from Horn to Jerry Simmons had not been disqualified by a holding penalty. Detroit took over in the third period. Number 42, Algie Taylor, outraced everybody and the Lions were on the board. Then Landry hit for a 76-yard score as Earl McCullough beat Bill Thompson and tantalized him with his fleet feet all the way home. A 
A flare pass to Steve Owen set up a field goal. And Detroit had 17 points in the third period. Denver regained the lead briefly on a five-yard run by Bobby Anderson. But Landry and Charlie Sanders took the lead and the game back as Detroit won a tough one from Denver, 24 to 20. So far this year, the surprising Chicago Bears have won four games with three different quarterbacks, while the Packers have found some success with rookie Scott Hunter under the tutelage of Bart Starr. But what made the difference, Pat, in their game last week was a hurricane named John Brockington. For the Green Bay Packers, Bart Starr wears the proud face of the past, and Scott Hunter's is the hopeful face of the future. In Chicago against the rival Bears, number 16 Hunter and number 42 John Brockington had a lot to do with bringing the future back home to Green Bay. Brockington burst the 100-yard mark for the third time this year. Against the Bears, the big rookie powered for 142 yards and 30 carries. For 54 minutes, no bear with a ball set foot inside the Packers' 30 as the rebuilt Packer defense defused the Chicago attack. But in the final six minutes, the Bears went boom. Number 10, Bobby Douglas scrambled and found number 43, George Farmer, open for six. And moments later, Dick Butkus caused and recovered a Dave Hampton fumble and Bobby Douglas tied the game on a disputed quarterback sneak. But a subsequent Packer field goal and two big plays by Scott Hunter won the game for Green Bay. First, Hunter hit number 84, Carol Dale, for 31 yards and a score. Then Hunter and number 44, Donnie Anderson, set up a second touchdown with this 39-yard play. Rockington paid off with a seven-yard slant, and in a game that almost got away, Green Bay upset Chicago 17-14. tied to remain tied for the lead in the tight AFC West. And that was before last week when the tide turned as the Raiders tied again. But the Chiefs lost to untie the tie for the time being, I think. New York Shea Stadium last week was the site of the untying of the AFC West. The injury rack Jets had won only two games, were last in offense, next to last in defense, and were able to start only three regulars on their defensive team. The wind was gusting to 35 miles per hour, and the stage was set for an upset. On the game's first series, league-leading punter Gerald Wilson fumbled, and the Jets had the opening to their only touchdown. Rookie runner John Riggins then rampaged 25 yards to the Kansas City Four. Jet touchdowns have been a rare sight this season. Emerson Boozer scored the only one last Sunday. When Kansas City regained possession, Lynn Dawson looked for the NFL's leading yardage-consuming machine, Otis Taylor, and the Chiefs were on the way back. For the tying touchdown, Kansas City used a tight formation with no wide receivers, and Dawson found rookie runner Mike Adamley for his first professional touchdown. And probably no touchdown is ever remembered as well as the first.
For the rest of the game, the Chiefs were allowed only three more points by the reconstructed but suddenly savage Jet defense. For both teams, it was a day for defense. The Bob Davis-led Jets managed just nine yards through the air. Trailing by 13-10 in the fourth quarter, Lynn Dawson had to cut through the wind to win. He managed the second and the last completion to Taylor. But the Jets came up with two fourth quarter interceptions to sew up their third victory. The loss dropped the Chiefs one half game behind Oakland in the AFC West. Well, Pat, I guess that big loss to the Jets left the Chiefs fit to be tied. Not quite, Tom, but a tie would have kept the Chiefs in first place because down in New Orleans, those ever-toughening Saints tied one on and played Oakland even up. In New Orleans, the Saints' field goal attempt became a fake which fooled everyone, including themselves. And despite the fact that Ed Hargett completed the pass, the Saints were in big trouble. They were up against the ever-dangerous Oakland Raiders. Even Archie Manning was no match for the Cobra-quick Oakland secondary. Meanwhile, the Raider offense was, as usual, that sterling silver and black combination of LaMonica to Fred Blitnikoff. When Ed Hargett replaced Manning, he quickly caught up with Archie in one category of the passing department, thanks to number 43, George Atkinson. And then Pete Banizak boiled over behind number 64, George Beeler, and ho-hum, it was Oakland 14, New Orleans nothing in the third period. But the Saints were far from finished as Ed Hargett led them on a land-grabbing expedition. The yards came tough, but the payoff was worthwhile. Number 42, Jim Strong, brought the Saints to within 14 to seven as he slipped into a big hole and then on into the end zone. The Raiders countered with their old standby, Daryl to Fred. Simple but effective, as Fred was quick to point out to number 22, D'Artagnan Martin. But the Saints were reluctant to wither. They scored on a two-yarder, and on the ensuing kickoff, came up with a big break. And once again, Ed Hargett led them on a ground gobbling sortie. And with just 13 seconds left in the game, Hargett hit Dave Parks in the end zone that tied at 21 all. For the Saints, it was a moral victory. For the Raiders, it was their second tie in a row, which of course is like kissing your sister when she's got the mumps. After seven weeks of indecision at quarterback, Tom Landry was still undecided. So late one night last week, as he walked through an orchard in suburban Dallas, he paused and shook an apple tree. And so the story goes, out fell Roger Staubach. A win against the Cardinals meant survival in the NFC East for the Dallas Cowboys. On defense, they gambled with eight-man blitzes and dealt out a beating to Cardinal quarterback Jimmy Hart. On offense, Tom Landry's gamble was with Roger Staubach, who fancy-footed through the Cardinals for over 90 yards. Mm -hmm. 
With the score tied at three, St. Louis twice feasted on cornerback Isaac Thomas, number 37. A raw rookie cornerback ripe for plucking. Once Thomas was roasted by John Gilliam, and then he was eaten whole by Dave Williams, whose touchdown gave the Cardinals a 10-3 lead at the half. St. Louis seemed to have the game nicely in hand when Jim Hart found sweet-fingered Jackie Smith all alone in the end zone. But the Cardinals were detected holding on the play, and Dallas later turned this good fortune into a touchdown when Staubach split the scenes with a strike to tight end Mike Ditka. In the last quarter, Staubach smartly maneuvered the Cowboys into position to break the 13-13 stalemate. Tony Fritch's 26-yard field goal capped a 16-13 victory as Dallas kept treading water in the NFC East. Looks like Dallas has finally found their quarterback, Tom. That's true, Pat, and on Sunday, the Eagles finally found something to their defense, and it proved to be too much for the Washington Redskins. In Washington, the awestruck fans came in all sizes. They were cute and cuddly or big, bearish and swaggering, and all firm in the conviction that the Eagles were nothing more than cannon fodder for their red-hot Redskins. Neither the fans nor the vintage Washington defense showed any respect for the impish Eagle offense. Through the air and on the ground, the white shirts were battered by the burgundy. But early optimism faded when it became apparent that the hard-hitting Redskins were being outslugged and out-toughed by the Eagles. Larry Brown, number 43, the NFC's leading rusher, gained an anemic 43 yards and 22 carries, and often was a middleman caught in a collision. While Brown lay bruised and dizzied, quarterback Billy Kilmer sat and searched for the answer that would unlock the Eagles' defense. He never found it. Four times, Kilmer was intercepted. Twice by brash Bill Bradley, who turns defense into instant offense for Philadelphia. After a scoreless first half, the Eagles gained a 7-0 advantage when reserve quarterback Pete Lisk found setback Ronnie Bull with a perfect touchdown strike. But the real story of this game was not in what the Eagles did, but what they didn't do. Four times, Philadelphia was betrayed by Happy Feller's erratic toe. Trying to cement an Eagles victory late in the last quarter, Feller's field goal try was blocked and spectacular Speedy Duncan, number 45, turned the game around for Washington. Billy Kilmer was given one too many chances, and behind airtight protection, he threw a rainbow to Clifton McNeil that tied the game at seven. With 50 seconds remaining, Washington moved within one play of a winning field goal, and place kicker Kurt Knight nervously waited for his moment of glory. It never came. Kilmer elected to go for broke and threw into the teeth of double coverage and was intercepted by Bradley again. Bradley returned to the Eagles 43. 35 seconds remain. On Pete Lisk's first two tries, he was harassed, hurried, and buried by the Redskins. There were no timeouts left, but there was still time, 21 seconds. Time for just one pass and maybe a field goal try. Pete Lisk's plan was simple. Throw up a prayer and pray somebody would catch it. When Harold Jackson was unable to reach the sidelines, the Eagles rushed out their kicking unit, but the game-wise Redskins stalled long enough to kill the clock. 
Happy Feller was denied a fifth chance and the game ended. It was a shocking end for a team that deserved much better than a tie. A 7-7 tie. I don't think many people predicted that one, Pat. I know I didn't. Well, I am now 10-7 and seven on predictions, and you've dropped to 8-9. and nine. I think maybe I peaked too early. <laughs> what about the Redskins and the Chicago Bears in Chicago? I can't conceive of the Redskins continuing to make the kind of mistakes they've been making in the last three or four weeks. So I'll go with Washington. I'll go with that good Chicago defense to stop Billy Kilmer's Redskin offense completely cold, Pat. Okay. At any rate, we'll be back next week to show you what happens. I'm Pat Summerall. And I'm Tom Brookshire, and we'll see you next week.